you want to see the numbers of people that got scammed first? Yeah. 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 So it was not as uh, so. 49 of you signed a, an adversary's key, uh, which is not bad. That's a quarter of the box. Uh, and then if we looked at it, so it has a pretty long tail distribution. So one person signed four adversarial keys, two people signed three, a decent amount of two, and the rest one. So, you know, you should give yourselves a round of applause, whatever uh, you did.
No mentor questions? All right, hold on. <laughs> Can we just have a test of true false? No. Next question. Can you have a test that's all true false? No. Oh, next question. <laughs> you want it? No. Exam is no. no. <laughs> it's guaranteed. What's the structure of a breakdown of the answer? So is it like uh, 10 questions or multiple choice regarding it and then like three responses or? Could be anything. I don't know. Is that going to help you study for it? If I say it's two questions or a hundred questions, does that help and change your study? No, but it's never carried before. Okay, you're already mentally prepared. Yeah. Everything we've covered up until now, <laughs> until after this class.
going to talk about what's on or not on the test. This is uh, not something I'll do. Yeah? Uh, will we have the whole class period to work on the test? Yes, you'll have the whole class period to work on the test, absolutely. 115 minutes just for you. Anything else? All right. Going once. You can't do the installing for them? All right. No, I, I think the LAC typo was lattice based access control. What was that? LDAC, lattice based. The only thing that's reasonably close. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. <laughs> I think it's just straight up a typo. Okay. Uh, or maybe I just added random acronyms on there to. Uh, See if you put that as something, that would be a silly thing. You're just making up for the test. That's possible. It's more likely a typo. I don't do that. Yeah. Did you mean to say 115? Yes. No, an hour and 15, right? 60, 15, 75 minutes. Certain everything that we talked about in class has been something that's been on a slide, so that would make sense. Um, yeah, everything that we've talked about up until end of today. All right, three more minutes. So.
does, does the email say the, the, the final grade like complete? How can I can do your final grade if we haven't had all the assignments yet? Well, that means like up to that point. Right. You don't like that? No. <laughs> wow. you, you can do it. You, have, you know math. You know it's three, we have four assignments. Add them together, divide by 400, that's your turn. <laughs> but it's not that much fun to put on there, too. You get the same argument. Yeah, but it doesn't make sense because it's not your final grade because you don't have a grade yet until we're done with everything. We still have the midterm, we still have the final exam, we still have the homework assignments. So, But you also know all of those percentages from the syllabus, so you can also calculate those. I have faith in your abilities. All right, this two last ones, yeah. How long does it take you to grade the test? Hmm. I don't know. Do we like an average? Four weeks. A day. Did that matter? <laughs> Is it going to change how you approach the class? <laughs> I know you want it as soon as possible. We will try. There's 194 of you, so you know, it takes some time. As soon as we have grades, you will have them back. Uh, I was just curious if we were still going to have the uh, six or less assignments that I think so. We're shooting for, probably on target right now for six, maybe one more. I don't know. Well, you'll have a new homework assignment on Tuesday as well, after the exam. I've been holding it off so you can start focus on the exam and then you'll have that assignment. All right, let's run roll. It's still not done.
How did A host A know that host B was in its local network? Yeah, so the net masks, the network IDs are the same. So in this example, there's actually, we don't have enough information to even say that that is the case, right? The net mask can be all the way to, I think, slash 31. So it could be like a tiny network with is that two hosts on it or three hosts or something. Uh, maybe two, I think. And so we need more information to know, but we, if we say that they are in the local network, then this process is what has to happen. Questions on this? Yeah. Uh, right here. Yeah. Um, so, how does like this host be after like this host in A? Like, what if like host A is on like the Wi-Fi? Like, does it Okay. Yeah. So, okay. The question is, uh, does host B have to respond to host A? send any IP packets to host B. For all intents and purposes, host A will think that host B is down. So the, the technical answer is no. There's nothing that, like, host B doesn't have to respond, but it may not necessarily know who host A is, right? And so in that sense, um, it can decide to drop or block the traffic once it knows the IP address. Maybe that's more information to know exactly who it is. What if host B responds back with fraudulent information? So like host B sends back uh, specifically spoofed MAC address that mm -hmm. does exist on the network but is not host B's. Sure. So then, okay, let's go over. We got to cover one thing and talk about that. So <laughs> let's do that in the context of what's the difference between a hub and a switch? What is what are these devices used for? Yeah, like a switch you can send connections to, and they're gonna be able to route or not like route, but like throw based on the MAC address, if I remember correctly. And then hubs are basically it takes in data and then just floods it to the entire connection space. Yeah. So let's look at. I can't show my beautiful pictures that I did last time, but if we look. We had an example of, we'll call it, we'll use host A and host B right now. So this is the specific thing we're talking about here, the switch, right? So in this diagram, we have two hosts A and B that are connected on a local network through a switch uh, or some device. Uh, anybody have, no, that'd be weird, why would you have a switch on you? <laughs> You have a Nintendo Switch, you're resetting your uh, nipper. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, networking switch. There we go, cool. So, all kinds of networking switches. Oh, great. This is a 52 port switch. So, you connect a bunch of machines here, and it will uh, route traffic through them, right? So old school switches, you can think of Wi-Fi networks are essentially the same. The exact communication medium is not over an ethernet cord or whatever, but the basic ideas are the same. So, okay. So we have these devices. So we have host A, B, and now we have host C that we're also gonna connect to this switch. So packet comes in from host A. How does the switch know where to send it. So there's 52 ports on that switch. How does it know where that packet goes out? So the cheapest and easiest way to do it is to say, who cares? <laughs> right? I don't care where this goes. I'm just going to send it to everyone. So whenever one packet comes in on that port, it goes out to all the other ports to everyone else. Right? So this is the hub model. So packet comes in, and then it gets sprayed to every single host that's connected here. So here we have our 52 hosts. A packet comes in on A, 
any one of these ports and it gets sent to every single other port. What is a problem there? Or what's potentially a problem with that? Yeah, no privacy. No privacy in what sense? Uh, if, if a message is meant, is meant for, uh, for one person, then other people can still see it. Yeah, so host A and C are communicating, right? Every packet that gets sent will also be sent to host B. By default, their network card will drop the packets, but you can set your network card to be in what they call promiscuous mode that listens to everything, and you can see all the packets. What else? Yeah. Uh, potential for collisions. Potential for collisions? In what sense? Uh, if you have multiple or just a lot of data going over the network at once, and you're getting constant flood of input data, it's like you could collide and then drop packets, and you lost data. How do you yeah, so you think about it, let's say, uh, let's make it easy in some sense and say, we'll talk about like, let's say the cable, each of these has a one gig gigabit per second or per whatever, uh, right? One gigabit per second bandwidth on each of these links, right? If, uh, now I'm gonna add another host here. We'll call it D to just keep with this thing. So A and B are transferring uh, 100 gigabytes of a movie file or whatever, and D and C are also sharing 100 gigabytes of a movie file. What's the throughput going to be for those? It's not like a trick question. So. Let's get rid of B and D. A, uh, a and B are sharing a, so A is able to send one gigabit per second. That gets sent out on every other one of these links, right? So every link is using one gigabit per second, right? So it's transferring it at one gigabit per second. Now if B and, if uh, D and C start sharing and using a movie, can they use one gigabit per second? Why not? There's only one gigabit or so. There's already one gigabit per second already being used on this link to broadcast ACE packets. So you need, so, I don't know. I don't know if this is, it would definitely decrease. I don't know the exact amount. This point is not really important. We'll call it uh, 0 0.5 gigabit. Anyways, the speed's gonna be reduced because each of them have to share this, the total of all of these links. Does that make sense? So you have a clear performance problem here. So what's the problem with sending A's traffic to C to both D and B? <coughs> yeah, we're wasting bandwidth, right? It seems crazy. Not only is it bad from a security perspective, but you know, these things were developed back when we just wanted stuff to work, we didn't care about security. Um, so is this used anymore? <laughs> I think, well, let's check real quick. We are on Amazon. I don't know if you can buy these anymore, that's interesting. Some of those cheap ones will do. Some of the cheap ones will be? Yeah, uh, that makes sense. I think the answer is yes, you can find some devices that are still like this. So, what does the switch need to do? Like, so how can the switch know that it should send, A is sending traffic and it should only send it on the port that B is connected to? And not to C or D. Yeah. Appended to the IP address. Appended to what? IP address, whatever the hub is. Okay, so what do you mean appended to the IP address? Or append what to the IP address? Like the specific port that the traffic should be directed to. Right, okay, and a confusing thing is that we're talking about here. So we're gonna use port in another context later on, but here we're talking about physical ports on the Ethernet switch, right? The switch needs to know exactly how many ports it has. Okay, so one way would be to use the IP address, so to maybe look at the traffic and figure out what IP address goes where. Yeah. Um, uh, the sender has to specify the port in the packet. Mm. The sender has to specify the port, and I have to change the whole IP TCP networking stack in order to because how does A know what port it's connected to, right? So then it would have to have some way to ask the switch, what port am I connected to, and then send that information out. Yeah. Maybe like all the devices in order to connect to the hub have to have, or the switch have to tell it, hey, this is my, when I'm connected, this is my IP address, and this is my MAC address. 
So now if you ever receive something for that, send it to me. Okay, cool. What, why does the switch need why does A need to tell the switch that? Oh it just knows it. How can it know it? Because no packets have a source that IP the destination IP is attached to them. Um, yeah, so two things. A um, I don't have a good answer for why. Uh, I think there probably is one. I just can't think of it right off the top of my head. But um, the switch is going to essentially work only at the Ethernet layer. I, and I think actually probably the argument would be for speed. So it doesn't have to parse the Ethernet header and then parse the IP header and to figure out where the packet goes and then send it. So it's just basing it off of the Ethernet information of where this packet goes. The other nice thing is then your switch doesn't care if it's IPv4, IPv6, whatever. You can connect it as long as it's talking Ethernet over the local network. They can figure out what's going on. So the super interesting thing is that your router can, or your, sorry, I need to be careful. The switch can actually spy on the ARP request and the ARP request. It can look at all of the packets that are coming out on every switch, every port on the switch. And so here it can say, oh, host A sent an ARP request. So A can know that host A, let's call it port one, host A on, so port one has the MAC address 8046-7483. And now when somebody else sends a packet, like here with a destination of 8046-7483, the switch goes, oh, send it out on port one, because I, I know the mapping between that MAC address is on port one. What about for, what does it do for this address? It's a broadcast, it deliberately needs everyone. So this ARP request, you know, fundamentally we don't know who we're talking to yet, so we need this to go everywhere. Yes? If, uh, if the switch doesn't need you to tell it what your MAC address or IP address is, then why can't you instead of asking the other devices what their Mac and IP address is, why can't I just ask the switch and be like, hey, you tell me where this person is at? One example, I mean, one reason would be that the networking protocol doesn't assume any specific networking device. So the protocol doesn't care if you have a hub or switch or anything, right? And the switch you can think of actually technically Acts transparently, um, and I mean the. Anyways, it's kind of a crazy thing, but they used to. Uh, I don't know if it was actually over Ethernet, but uh, before there was. So we have A, B. I think this was before switches. You could actually have a ring. They called it like a a ring of local networks, so you would get a packet, if it was for you, great, you keep it, process it, if not, you give it to the next person on the list. And so you actually don't have a physical device of a switch, but you can broadcast everything here, right, because it will eventually get to everyone. You can send a message to somebody, it just may take a few physical hops to get there, but there's no dedicated networking switch in this model. Um, right. So you can think of different ways to do a local network that doesn't involve having a dedicated switch to ask questions to. Okay, yeah, so the protocol is supposed to work regardless of what type. Exactly, yeah, okay. Cool. So this is the fundamental difference between a switch and a hub. So this, so, and why this is important? Somebody asked a question that brought us here that I don't remember. Yes. It was asking about if the, the, the reply sends back a fraudulent MAC address. Yes. Okay. Good, good, good. Um, okay. Yes. Let's keep that in mind as we go forward. So now that we know the actually what is going on, this is a good example of knowing how a networking equipment actually works impacts the security of the system. And this is something that you all even pointed out, maybe it's because we're in the context of security class. When you look at this hub, the first thing somebody said was privacy or security, right? The problem is 
traffic from A to C is being transmitted to everyone else on the network, which is clearly bad. Um, so as we focus our attention towards from learning how local networks work to now trying to attack them, so imagine we are a malicious <coughs> person on this network. What do we want to do? What are our goals as an attacker? Um, gain access to packets that weren't intended for us. Yeah, so eavesdrop or sniff or s on traffic that was not intended for us to be able to read uh, other types of communication. Yeah. Uh, disrupt traffic. So stop traffic. Disrupt traffic. So we may want to, um, like, so in the case of think about a we're whatever breaking into a house and there's an alarm system that's connected to the internet are connected. If we're able to disrupt those packets, it's never able to phone home to say that there's been a break in or something. Yeah. Also, potentially send packets to uh, machines of the network that we shouldn't be able to send packets to. Yeah, or maybe another way to think about that would be impersonate another machine on the network, right? If there's a trust relationship, maybe you have a server at home that trusts your laptop, so you can log into your server without a password. Now, if somebody else, if I'm on the network, if I can impersonate you and log in as if I was that IP address to that system? Yeah. Um, so if you're like a file sharing system set up, and you get someone who's malware in the system, mm -hmm. and the malware can set like, malicious. Yeah, so we may be able to, maybe even more insidious is rather than getting access to their system, if we're able to intercept and be, uh, like we talked about a crypto, like a man in the middle of the, the file share traffic, we can insert our own malicious content into those that communication. Anything else? So how'd you come up with these attacks? Brain? Imagination. Imagination. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. And all of these goals, right, follow the three fundamental aspects of security, right? Confidentiality, integrity, availability. Every single attack that you just mentioned follows from those three concepts. So if you think about, okay, how do I violate your confidentiality? Well, I want to read traffic that two machines are talking to that I shouldn't be able to read. If you want to uh, violate integrity, you want to inject traffic that was never meant to be sent, and availability was kill traffic. So we went through all of those, right? I think that's, yeah. Okay, cool. So we're gonna, we're gonna think about in the network context, these have kind of slightly different names, although they mean the same thing. We want to sniff traffic, so we want to eavesdrop on traffic that we're not supposed to see. We want to spoof traffic, make it appear as if it's coming from another machine. And we want to hijack communications by being able to manipulate or add our own information to communications. So now that we have an idea of how this works, how do we perform sniffing if we're in a hub environment? Just plug in, just exist, right? Think about how bad security was if that's all it took, right? Um, so, and really all you need to do, this is something, I believe, I mean, you have to have a sudo on your computer, but you can um, easily do this. It's usually the commands will do it uh, for you, the tools will do it for you. Um, but promiscuous mode tells your network interface, usually your network interface, your network card will drop all packets that are not meant for your MAC address or are not broadcast. If you turn this on, the, your operating system gets all the packets. So this allows you to inspect every packet that's being sent. Um, now, we have this problem of, okay, but if we're using switched internet, we're not gonna get the traffic from A to C, right? We just had in our example, of A and C here, right? Uh, erase all of right on a switch network. The communication between A and C, right? Once the switch knows the mappings of ports to MAC addresses. It's going to send that packet from A just to C on that port and the response back from C to A back on that port. So as an attacker, we won't be able to see that. But 
as we talked about, what actually prevents us from pretending to be C? Or think about it a different way. How does the switch know that C is on port 4 and not on port 2? Yeah. Yeah, not, not just the machine, but the port, right? Because fundamentally, the switch has no idea who's on what port. All it knows is I've seen a, usually it only listens to ARP message, so I've seen an ARP reply that says that this machine is on, this MAC address is on this physical port. That's all it does. And the, the thing to think about is uh, switches are very fast. Some of them are like 10 gigabit per second, 100 gigabit per second, right? Really fast switches. So it needs to make a decision very quickly on where does this packet go. And so it is not, they're not smart devices, really. They're very dumb because they need to be very fast. Okay. We'll go to exactly how we can do this in a second. But first, why do we even want to sniff? So why do we want to eavesdrop on communications? Yeah? So maybe gather login information? Say what? Maybe gather login information? Yeah, so maybe gather login information, so our authentication credentials is useful? Yes. Yes, we talked about a whole section on authentication. Right? Useful, very useful. A lot of protocols that are much more common than you'd think actually still transmit login information in the clear, meaning not encrypted. So FTP, uh, POP is accessing email, IMAP, another way to access email, HTTP, all of these things by default will transmit the credentials in the clear. There exists, I believe, secure versions of all of these where it will do TLS or make some kind of encrypted connection to the other side in which case uh, sniffing doesn't help you steal the password, but this is a very good way um, to collect username and passwords. It is email. Now, not only do you have username and password, but now all the emails are being transmitted in the clear. You can read all the emails, files that are downloaded. Um, if you're trying to break into a network with the uh, websites that somebody's browsing, maybe be useful. Why? Yeah, so maybe that's where you can use the password. What else? I was thinking uh, you could set up like a fake landing page for the most commonly used websites. Yeah, so you could make fake targeted phishing pages, deliberately targeting that person of what pages they're more likely to visit. Yeah. Blackmail. Blackmail, if it's sites they shouldn't be seeing or shouldn't be looking at, maybe during work hours. Uh, yeah, all, all good things. Uh, and usually, well, Anyways, uh, the main way you do this is dump and file uh, traffic to a file to analyze it later. Um, lucky for you, you don't have to do this on your own. There are a lot of tools that help you collect, analyze, and even replay traffic against a different machine. Uh, these are incredibly useful tools uh, for your future career if you're debugging anything network related. Um, yeah. Does HTTPS Yes, so HTTPS, uh, assuming it's set up correctly. So there, at least from eavesdropping, the answer is yes. So if the website is using HTTPS, they can't see, they can know what website you're talking to at the high level, the domain name. They won't be able to know the exact path that you're visiting, and they also won't be able to know the content of anything you're sending or receiving. I don't know the size of the data, right? The what? The, um, the amount of data you're sending here. So, it doesn't, like, the TLS encryption doesn't change the size of the data, does it? Right. It also, technically, it doesn't change the size of the data. So, people have uh, done studies that look at inferring what pages on a website you're visiting based on the size of the encrypted communication. And that's definitely possible. Um, so, specifically, I've done this uh, was a couple of years ago. I was setting up a homework assignment. And it was like a web hacking assignment, and it turned out that I was, I couldn't connect to the system, so I couldn't figure out exactly what was going on, so I was running uh, 
these commands to look at the traffic that my machine was sending, that the other machine was getting, that our router in the middle was getting. And so I was able to determine that uh, ASU firewall was blocking my connection. And that's why it was happening. Uh, there's great command line tools. I highly recommend if you're interested in security to get familiar with this. These are good tools to know about like, oh, I don't know. I, I don't understand why this is happening or uh, what's going on. TCP dump is your friend. It uh, collects all the traffic. So this I use this all the time to analyze why I can't connect to the internet or why something is wrong. TCP flow. Uh, Anyways, it collects more than TCP down. The TCP is a misnomer. Other tools to break them up. I will say one of the other most useful tools is uh, Wireshark. So Wireshark is an awesome tool that is an open source tool that will either read the output of TCP down uh, from a file and show you visually all the packets that are being sent on there. It will also parse the packet and show you all the different layers from the ethernet to the IP to TCP to the HTTP or whatever protocol it is, and it has a ton of different parsers for a lot of different uh, options. Um, oh, and just because I'm feeling dangerous, let's see what happens. So here I'm testing, uh, I can't remember what I was doing, but something I was trying to talk on port 9090 and it wasn't working, and so I was running TCP down to look at this.
I mean, depending on how the system works, I can try to ping all the machines in the network, and if they exist, they'll talk back to me. The router could prevent that, though, if it were the, the Wi-Fi router. Um, if you're on an open Wi-Fi, you could literally just turn your wireless router, or your wire, wireless card to sniff everybody's packet. So unencrypted Wi-Fi is crazy bad, because literally anyone, it's like being on a hub, where anyone in physical range can read what packets you're trying to send. Uh, yeah.
exactly the same fields that we talked about in that header. So I'm not lying. And yeah, so source IP, destination IP, all this stuff. You can go through everything and see everything. Good. At least I wasn't paying any embarrassing attention. All right. Okay, but then how do we actually, so we saw we can just connect and listen and hope that something gets sent. But how do we actually try to trick the system in order to eavesdrop a communication? Yeah. You were saying earlier that TCP was a what did you mean? Mm. I meant that on these tools, these TCP dump, TCP flow, TCP replay, uh, they apply to everything. TCP, UDP, okay. they'll set whatever you want. So, yeah, I, I've only noticed that now. Okay, we're going to do a network. Let's simplify this network. We like simple. Y, D. Address. 
What do I say? C is at MAC address of what? B2. B, right? The MAC address of host B. So if we reply, what will the switch do when it sees this packet? MAC address of C is at 2. No. Won't it send it to B and C? And both B and C then will reply. So B would have to get there faster than C. Yes, but let's ignore it. So let's say that, um, okay, let's go over one scenario. Uh, let's get rid of C. So C is offline, actually. But A is still trying to talk to it. It doesn't know that it's offline. Right? So A sends a request. says, hey, who has C? talk to C, C's IP address. It doesn't know what C's MAC address is because it could have changed. How do you know? I mean, how does A know? C's offline. C doesn't exist. It knows what IP address. It knows it needs to talk to IP address C. But when it gives this ARP reply back, all it knows is that it got an ARP reply that says C is at the MAC address of B. And at that point, it'll start talking to that as if B was C. Yeah. Exactly. They don't know the MAC address that is supposed to be quote associated with that IP address. No, it's it's uh, actually in this case the switch isn't really doing anything, right? So the switch is just deciding where things go. But because here we're impersonating a host that doesn't exist. No, there's no trust in the switch. We don't care about the switch at all, right? The key problem here is how do you map an IP address to a MAC address? You just have to ask everyone, and the problem is the protocol trusts that the response you get is correct. That's the key problem. Yeah. So we don't know that the ARP requests happen at some sort of interval frequently, right? I'm assuming that modern security measures aren't this simplistic, where it's like, oh, the MAC address change, or I guess a better way of asking is, if the ARP request has always had this specific MAC address and suddenly it gets a different one, wouldn't that flag the system say like, hey, that's odd. No. Nope. For the past 10 years, it's been this address, and suddenly you would think, but uh, you, of course you can do that, right? So a company could do that. Or um, 
we'll talk about it more in defenses, but there's ways to uh, authenticate ports. So if anybody's ever worked in uh, an organization where physical Ethernet ports, you have to authenticate to even use it and talk to it, uh, that's so that they know, so that there's trust in who's connecting with the network. Yeah. Yeah, so interesting. So then let's go through a different scenario. Let's go to the scenario where C is online. <coughs> right, so same thing happens. A sends an ARP request to the entire network. It goes to both B and C. And then what happens? They both reply. Right? What do those replies look like? What does C's reply look like? <laughs> right? These both get sent out here. And they both go back to A. So A gets, so let's forget for a moment this issue of timing. Let's say you get to both of them. How does it know which one is correct? It doesn't. Fundamentally, it doesn't. It does, there's no information that it has to be able to differentiate which is which. There's absolutely no way it can tell which is which, yeah. And that's assuming the switch is a layer two device and all those the back address? Yes. Uh, I don't like thinking about it in terms of layers like that, but yes, the switch is only acting on the ethernet frame. And even beyond that, it really doesn't get into VLANs and all this other stuff, but it fundamentally doesn't change what's happening here. Yeah? Uh, so like, back a little bit. So at the very beginning of the process, when A decides for the first time it's going to talk to C, it yes. does that ARP request. If it doesn't know what C is, how does it know that it wants to talk to C? How does it get a signal that? What does it know about C? I don't know, that's what I'm saying. I don't know. Yeah, what a, so to talk to any machine on the network, what do you mean? IP address. IP address, exactly. So when we say C, we mean C's IP address. Right? So this is 192.168.0.10. I know I want to talk to that machine. We'll ignore for now how we know we want to talk to that specific machine. Let's say we want to talk to that machine. Right? The question is how to do that. And that's, and in here, once you have that IP address, you have no way, so there's absolutely no way of for A to know, is this reply correct or is this reply correct? And maybe it's a misconfiguration. It doesn't necessarily have to be an attack, right? It could be a misconfiguration here or something, or maybe you have two hosts who legitimately think they have the right IP address. It's actually, this is one of the most insane problems you can ever have. This has happened, uh, if you've ever run a network and you've run out of uh, DHCP IP addresses and it starts reusing ones, you go to SSH into a machine and half the time it works, half the time it doesn't. It's like the most bizarre error you can have. Um, it's happened to me a few times, so I'm familiar with it. But, so, what does A do? So A has to have some way of knowing which one. What was it? It could flip a coin, but the fact of the matter is these are not going to come in simultaneously, right? There has to be some ordering, right? Yeah, just takes the latest one. Yeah, you can just take the latest one and update your cache, right? You look at the ARP cache, ARP cache A, you can look at all your ARP entries. We could just say, well, take the latest one that comes in. So if it's, so let's go through both these scenarios. So let's say it takes the first one that comes in and locks that in for 30 seconds or whatever. Then what does the attacker need to do in order to trick A to talk to it? Wait 30 seconds to be the fastest one. Be the fastest one. It has to beat C and be the very first one. Right? How can it do that? Yeah, one way would be maybe uh, make C slower, like DOS C with a bunch of traffic, send it a bunch of traffic so you can be faster. Um, what else? Yeah. Could it constantly send the reply? Constantly send the reply and just hope that in that next 30 second window you'll be the first one? What if it's, what if uh, A takes the last one? What does it do? Wait a while to reply. It could wait a while to reply, or it could just use the same technique of continually sending. So, if you want to impersonate another host of the network, all you
you need to do is continually send ARP replies back to that, and it will just continue updating its cache with your MAC address and that IP address. Yeah. Wouldn't you not even need to do it continuously? If you're all on the same network, wouldn't you just get the reply and wait for that and then set after? So if you, yeah, yes, but you don't know. So you get the request, but you don't get C's reply. Because it, its destination is the MAC address of A, so the switch never sends it to you. Oh, so you don't know exactly when it's going to reply, so if you just want to be easy, just send it every half second. I thought that there's a switch. Like, OK, OK. Yeah, so it says the MAC address of A is on 2. It knows the MAC address of C is on 3. So when it gets the reply, uh, this reply, the MAC, the ARP reply sees that the MAC address of C. That's destination MAC address is A, which means it only goes out on port one. So the only reason that B got A was because there was no on the request because it doesn't know the request goes to a broadcast, it goes to everyone. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not every single time, but yes. It, it has to know the, uh, so it catches it for about roughly 30 seconds. Um, but yeah, after that 30 seconds, it will do another ARP request. Uh, now, so this allows us to impersonate C, but what if we want to actually man in the middle of their connections and have all of their communication go through us? So in this scenario, we convince A that we're C. Yeah. You have to convince C that you're A. Exactly. We, have to, we can do it the exact same logic, convincing C that we're A. And now if we're able to trick each of them so that their MAC cache says C is at MAC address of C. And here we convince C that A is at the MAC address of C. Uh, sorry. B. I forgot who was who. Now, whenever they try to talk to each other, all of their traffic will flow through us. So we can sniff it, we can spoof it, we can change things. Um, we really own all of their communication. So this is, we'll just briefly walk through this. Um, and this is, uh, yeah, anyways, I'll let you go through this. We just went through this. Anyways, there. So, as we talked about, most tools will um, just repeatedly send ARP replies in order to do this. And there's tools you can use. Uh, EdgarCat is actually a tool to do this. So on your local network, you choose two hosts, and you can force all of their communication to go through them. Then you use TCP dump, and now you can see all that traffic that's being sent through you. So this is how on a local area network, you're able to trick all the traffic to come through you. I will warn you, though, if you want to play with this, uh, A, do it at home. B, don't use a wireless network because of the way, like the wireless switch it's very difficult to impersonate other people and convince the wireless network that you are. It depends. It, I think you can do it in some wireless networks, but not in others, because fundamentally the switch knows who your MAC address should be because it started an encrypted session with you. So, but if you have a physical switch to play with, you can do this at home. It's super fun. Uh, set up two machines. Set up a third machine to 